Hi there, Sonia here. Welcome back to another episode of the Help I'm Artist podcast. I'm so glad you could join me. From wherever you are in the world, welcome. You may be wondering, what is this podcast actually all about? And why should you spend your precious time listening to it? Well, it's simple. I love seeing artists succeed. And this podcast is there to help artists not only grow in their art, but build a healthy art career. As artists, so much about what we do comes from within us. How we feel and what we think will literally determine our steps. And that is why I focus so much on the mindset behind good art. In order to grow in our art and actually earn a living from our creativity, we need to not only develop our artistic skills, but we need to adopt a healthy business mindset. As artists, we need to realize that we are in business. But how do we do this? How do we reach our potential art audience? And what tools can we use to communicate this? The Help I'm Artist podcast is here to help you on your journey. Whether you're just starting out, or you've been a working artist for a while, or just maybe you are secretly thinking about seriously pursuing some form of creativity. Then I hope that you will be inspired to follow your creative passions and start to take new steps. Have you ever wondered if the price you are asking for your art is too high? Or maybe that what you're asking is too little for your art. This episode comes with a special resource. This practical guide is here for you to download and will help you find your pricing sweet spot and take the guessing out of pricing your art. You will find the link of this free resource on my website. But back to today's episode. Today I'll draw back the curtain and take a look at the role and the work of an art curator. Aniko Auneel is originally from Hungary, but now resides in the Netherlands. Aniko uniquely weaves together her expertise as a cultural historian and her vast experience as an art curator. She has co-organized and designed more than 30 exhibitions. She has juried art shows, authored books, lectures at universities, and writes a regular art blog. She is a member of the A. Todd Sander Art Foundation, in which she treasures the art of her grandfather, A. Todd Sander safeguarding the legacy of this world-renowned avant-garde artist who exhibited with artists like Picasso and Leger. I can safely say that she's an expert in her field and that art is deeply rooted in her DNA. I had the privilege to work closely with her when she commissioned one of my textile installations for an exhibition celebrating the 700th year of city rights in Kulemborg in the Netherlands. I experienced firsthand how the roles of the curator, the artist and the theme intertwine to compose an art exhibition. In this episode, Annika O'Neill shares more about the role of the curator, what artists need to know when working with a curator, the relationship between the theme, the art and the location. She shares about a huge international exhibition she recently curated in the inner city of Amsterdam, which attracted more than 10,000 visitors, and find out what made this exhibition such a success. And Annika shares some valuable insights to help artists develop their skills and grow in their art careers. Here's my conversation with Annika. Well, Annika, great that you could join me for the Help I'm Artist podcast. So looking forward to uh, sharing this uh, time with you. Thank you. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you married? Do you have family? Do you have children? Where do you live? Well, I'm uh, born in Hungary and um, married to a Dutchman, 25 years. And uh, we have three children. They are all grown up by now. And um, we live in the middle of the Netherlands. Where does your passion and your love for art originate? I was brought up with top quality art all over the place because my grandfather, uh, Arthur Chandler, or Chandler Arthur, mm-hmm. is, um, is a famous artist in Hungary mm-hmm. and he used to live in the avant-garde period in France in the 1930s. He 
worked as a, one of the important workers in uh, Arc en Ciel. That's a puppet theatre. Mm -hmm. And um, his uh, works are to be exhibited all over the world, like the last great exhibition was in 2010 in Malaga in the Picasso Museum, together with works of Oscar Schlemmer and uh, Pablo Picasso and Bernard Leger and other people from the avant-garde. Mm -hmm. And these are his works as well. They were very well exhibited. Okay. One of the main places there in Malaga. Okay, we'll put them in the show photos in the podcast notes. Okay, and yeah. And people can have a look. Yes, please. Okay. And uh, I come from an intellectual artistic family, so all kinds of people interested in, the, in culture, and they spoke languages, and they uh, discussed literature, theatre, yeah. music, the yeah. arts. So what did you experience as a child growing up in a family where there was art and culture, how did that affect you on the way that you thought mm -hmm. and how you learned mm -hmm. to appreciate art? Well, if you listen to, uh, to grown-ups, you, you think of yourself as very small, of course, but you hear and, and uh, listen discussions about poetry in French and you don't understand much of it in the, the first place. But then later on, um, keep seeing the same images and they get sort of engraved in your system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way people deal with art and how art creates a certain presence in a home, especially very well-made art and art that is not only top quality craftsmanship, but also comes from the heart, from real found treasures, existential treasures of the artist. Well, that sort of thing really shapes you it sets a certain standard and it teaches you to, to watch and see what is behind a two-dimensional, you know, canvas and some paint. Mm. So how do you, do you see art? I know that uh, you have, you're a curator, a cultural historian, you write uh, blogs, so you are busy with art all the time. Can you explain a little bit about looking at art? Mm -hmm. How do you go mm -hmm. about looking at art? Um, well, I, I, I love to visit um, museums or galleries or wherever I am in the world. I, I always make sure I visit an artist as well, just to learn and, uh, and to, to get acquainted, to, to build relationships. And um, um, I am really intrigued by an artwork that pulls me into its presence. Uh, I believe that an artwork with all its nuances and layers is created and is always there, but it really comes alive when it starts to communicate with the viewer. And there's something magical that happens between that work of art and the viewer at that moment, if the viewer is open enough and open enough to see and also to relate to its own reflections, to his or her own reactions from his or her own history and whatever is happening. And between that work of art and the viewer, there's this magical thing happening, and that's where art happens. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you can learn? You can certainly... Well, I'm on my way as well. <laughs> I'm not done yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm discovering more and more every time. And I, by I looking, understand. and I experience all kinds of art, uh, like uh, performances uh, are my favorite by now, but also two-dimensional, three-dimensional installations, video, photography, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it, it gives me a kick to experience uh, the awe and reverence, not uh, as much as for that work of art itself, but more what is happening, what it triggers. It's, it's a sort of spiritual process uh, that is happening. And if it's done well, and that's the kind of art I'm looking for, it will help you to sharpen your awareness and maybe a little bit to become more alive. Mm. That's the kind of art I'm looking for. Yeah. Of course, there's art that mirrors and shows you the shortcomings and uh, the problems, the great problems in society we are facing, globally as well. So that is um, legitimate and perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And every, every now and then I 
I, I work with that kind of art as well. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really looking for is art that can, um, that, that gives you, that makes you, challenges you and makes you a little more, a, a little richer in your, in your being. Mm -hmm. So mm. more aware, yeah. sharper, yeah. more alive. Yeah. And invariably a better person or make different decisions. So it can... I, uh, yes, well, I, I can't decide that. I mm -hmm. don't know what is going to happen. If I'm curating, I'm composing as well. So I invite the artist and I work with a location and I work with a theme. And in that triangle, I'm composing mm -hmm. something uh, that I think is really meaningful and that can sharpen you and mm -hmm. challenge you and, and uh, make you more alive. But what is going to happen is completely out of my control. Mm. Yeah. And it's not something I really want to control. So I describe in short ways because people need some kind of description often mm. to be able to enter the realm of the artist or, or, or the curator or the idea world of the artist and the curator. Mm -hmm. But um, I leave a lot of things open as well mm. because uh, we are all very different. You know, in old Hungarian, there's this... Uh, if you talk about a person, you talk, you use the same word as world. So you say, I walked down the road and I met 10 people today. Then you say, you use the word world. I walked down the road and I met 10 worlds today. Yeah. 7,000 million people yeah. on earth. They are all different. Yeah. They are all different the worlds. worlds. So yeah. um, it's not about control. It's about showing something that you have found that you really think is valuable and, mm. and trying to to share that mm. and trying to find points where you where you resonate with each other and that's such a pleasure mm. to resonate with another human being and find something that you say oh, yes I understand this is how I feel too it makes you feel rooted mm. on earth mm -hmm. <laughs> can you just share a little bit about the role of the curator yes the curator is in fact an art agent and uh, the curator composes uh, in the triangle of theme, art or artist and location. And um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a role of infotainment at the same time because you give a lot of information and at the same time entertain infotainment. the public. Infotainment, I haven't heard that before. <laughs> That's a sort of Dutch thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so you give information and uh, you talk about the art as well and uh, you talk about the location, in my case, often a sacred space, but not always. It's a museum or, or a school. And... Um, and you entertain because people love to be entertained, and um, and so there's an educational part as well. But mostly, I like to challenge people with uh, passion or compassion. You need an eye for detail because you're composing. Uh, you must have aesthetic design skills. Mm -hmm. um, so composition and how things work in a space. Exactly. Proportions. Exactly. And how Har uh, try, trying to, 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 to get to a certain point of harmony. And uh, that asks um, a, a lot of experience, I think. And maybe some, uh, some natural thing that you have, a talent. And um, so aesthetic, aesthetic design skills. You are a manager at the same time. You, um, you deal with... Um, contracts with the art artist uh, all the um, like the legal physical, side physical. or also the legal side and insurance yes insurance uh, the legal part of it so I, I have uh, formulas for contracts um, so we are very official and very professional in uh, in dealing with artists with locations and um, well you have to be able to manage that part as well as the fundraising so that's uh, that's a job in itself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's not always you. If if you manage to have a very good um, project manager with whom you work together as a curator, then the project manager would take most of this kind of stuff like uh, packaging and uh, and and insurance Transport. and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. uh, I I am used to doing that. Mm. And um, 
you have to have, of course, the ability to uh, to research and to have a sort of academically focused uh, work at the same time. Relationship is very important, so you must be able to relate to all these people and build a community around a project that works the best. Mm -hmm. I studied English literature and linguistics um, uh, and Finnish culture and language. Mm -hmm. And um, I taught on both faculties uh, in Budapest, in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to the Netherlands and uh, had three children and sort of uh, integrated to society, I went to University U U Utrecht. Utrecht. That's in the Netherlands. That's in, in the, the Netherlands. Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I studied cultural heritage because that's the, my other field of interest. And uh, from then on, I worked actually, I, I, I'm trying to link cultural heritage, religious cultural heritage most of the time, but not always, with modern art or contemporary art, modern and contemporary. I think I found my passion at last at my age, <laughs> and that is um, to find the spaces that has some sort of ancient resonance. And of course, it's the community that makes a place uh, sacred, special, set apart. Yeah. It's not the building itself. Yet, only the way they were built, you know, 1,200 years ago, or even older buildings. I worked with very old buildings. There's so much history just collected there, and uh, the space is very special. It has always been, it has been built as something really set apart. Yeah. Something very different from everyday life. Yeah. And I am always collecting and, and looking around for art, expressions of art, works of art that can fit in such a context. And not all fit in. Mm. And it's not easy. It, it, it asks expertise and experience and look and um, a network and uh, patience and <laughs> a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. But every now and then you have a perfect match. And I have a few examples from the... Yes, can you share an example of uh, when it all came together, a yes. project that you enjoyed working on and that... Mm -hmm. It was called Troubled Waters, Art Stations of the Cross in the inner city of Amsterdam. I was co-curator of this project together with Marlene Hengelaar. Mm -hmm. She is uh, editor-in-chief of Artway. Mm. Um, in 2018, we went to New York and we visited Art Stations of the Cross in downtown Manhattan. It was organized by Aaron Rosen and Katriona Lang. Aaron Rosen is a very interesting writer. This is one of the books I want to recommend as well. He mm -hmm. published Art and Religion in the 21st Century. Mm -hmm. And um, he curated, actually he made this whole concept together with Catriona um, to use the ancient old um, liturgical process of the Lent uh, up the way, the Lent is between Ash Wednesday and um, Easter. Mm -hmm. In the Catholic tradition, people often walked the Stations of the Cross, to remember what happened to Jesus, the last, his last um, walk to, uh, to Golgotha. And uh, this is something very Catholic in Europe now, but it has always been a tradition in Jerusalem. And the Crusaders brought this idea to Europe uh, in the 13th century, 12th, 13th century. And then this idea of Stations of the Cross, points where Jesus stopped or something happened, a bit uh, from uh, his uh, his trial mm -hmm. um, at Pilate's place to his um, to his crucifixion mm -hmm. and the resurrection was never uh, portrayed mm -hmm. because in uh, in the in the Catholic mass it happens in the mass itself, mm -hmm. but um, so they put it in the church building itself. So uh, all Catholic churches up to today in Europe they they, they all have um, a Stations of the Cross. 14 stations mm -hmm. um, it has changed through the centuries sometimes it was 45 stations oh. <laughs> and some of them were biblical some of them were not mentioned in the bible it was tradition okay. and um, so Aaron and Catriona uh, took the idea of the 14 stations and broke it out from within the walls of a church and brought it to the city street as it was in Jerusalem originally yeah. and um, linked this idea of Stations of the Cross with modern, modern or contemporary art. And that way, with the locations, you know, secular locations, religious locations, different 
kind of religious so background. buildings or spaces. Museums or, museums. or, or, um, or a monument. Like in New York, um, the 14 stations was the 9-11 monument itself. So if people walked the pilgrimage, as we call it, and, um, and reached the 14 stations, they just, you know, it, it's just that they became quiet and just meditated and thought about what happened to Jesus on the around that 14th station and how suffering in our age, what happens to these facets? Mm. How, how can you link art, compassion and justice mm. and passion mm. um, yeah, so. in, in these days? And uh, we brought that from New York. It started in London, then it went to Washington, D.C., New York, 2018. And 2019, we brought our Stations of the Cross to the inner city of Amsterdam. We had the Nicolaas Kerk, that's, that's the head, that's the main Catholic basilic of Amsterdam, as one of the, our locations. And Paradiso, it's um, uh, very well known in the Netherlands. It's a converted church and it's a pop podium at the moment. Mm -hmm. Very interesting to work with them. They are, that's, you see, that's my other interest, converted sacred spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, it is a church building, but it is a pop podium. Yeah. But we used it as one of the stations. We had real good connection to uh, yeah. to the museum. People. So you actually all your passions sort of culminated in this project. You could use your background in the yes. cultural heritage. You could use your in, with, with your art knowledge and as curatorship and networking. It culminated all in this project. Yes. yes. Uh, can you explain a little bit of what was your biggest challenge <clears throat> putting troubled waters together in Amsterdam? Uh, yeah, well, you are responsible. First of all, there's a theme and we sit together, we talk a lot, we do our research. So we find out what are the top locations we want to include mm -hmm. and who are the artists. So that takes, that's a long process. So and then research, a reading, lot of research, visiting artists. A lot of research. Visits. I love studio visits. That's the other thing I really... I, <laughs> That's the fun part. You can talk about it. But, um, but that, um, you know, it's very relational, this work, because... You, first of all, I love to do something that I love myself. I can only sell something if, if, I'm, if I'm completely convinced that this is something really unusual and brilliant and great. Yeah. So this brilliant idea from Aaron and Catriona, we got carte blanche. We could do whatever we wanted. Yeah. I worked with, um, I did almost all the locations, so uh, with different museums and um, a school and... Um, a, a, a garden, you know, and we work with churches, we work with Catholic churches, we work with um, Protestant churches, we work with the Syrian Orthodox, you see. Yeah. So it's it's all very different and you have the same project, but the project is so versatile. What I always loved, also loved, because it's about art, passion, compassion and justice, that we had a few of the communities living in the inner city of Amsterdam serving people, ex-prostitutes, drug addicts. Um, so beautiful communities, San Egidio and uh, Outer Zeitz 100. Different families together, they um, provide a home for these people. And they have a chapel that is 24-7 open. And the chapel itself is right, is, is neighboring to the biggest sex theater in the whole world. So people who queue up, Ten times a day, mm -hmm. in front of that theater, are watching the art we, we put in. We put in the window, and oh. what, and and they are. It's always open, so there people come in. So that kind of oh. locations. So we try to 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 find locations who are still serving the community of the inner city of Amsterdam mm. with the passion and compassion that Jesus served uh, uh, in his uh, days. Yeah. And uh, we had international artists, so the shipping only, and we organized that too. So mm -hmm. we, um, Marlene and I, we did the project management as well in the end. So it's mm -hmm. um, organizing the containers, mm -hmm. uh, insurance, taxation, trans insurance, transport. Yeah. Um, Hanging it up, putting it in and the putting it lighting together, it. lighting it, uh, mm -hmm. and the locations were really very good uh, working because they all wanted to be part of it so much so mm -hmm. we got an enormous amount in kind uh, they all worked together and mm -hmm. of course they opened uh, their doors to mm -hmm. the public so for the public it was something we have I think about 10,000 people visited it we don't know exactly mm -hmm. um, 
but um, we have um, some locations um, checked and, and wrote down exactly how many people and we have beautiful reactions, books written full with reactions. But the challenge here for a curator is not only the organizational part, uh, it's also, it has to fit together. So uh, you, we, we got a second um, theme to it, Troubled Waters, linking to the waters of Amsterdam and also our times, environmental issues and, um, and also how the waterways made Amsterdam as rich as it is today, you know, colonialism and, um, and all that kind of thing. So we could put a very local flavor to it after mm -hmm. New York and still plug in to the, to the great international stream of this idea, our Stations of the Cross with mm -hmm. modern contemporary art in a great cross point where in Amsterdam 15 million tourists a year come to visit. Mm -hmm. But for me, the most exciting part was, of course, visiting the ateliers, visiting the locations, uh, convince people. And if you do it, you come with all your passion and all your energy and you, you put it on the table and then you step back. And my aim is that our project will be their project as well. And in the end, it will be our project. So this project was such an enormous success because there were 14 locations with 14 artists and for all these locations and behind every location there are 50 volunteers and the whole um, organization and they all saw this as their own project mm. and that's why it was a great success so it was a community in the end mm. who did it. And do you have a favorite project or something you'd like to highlight from the uh, art stations of the cross yes um, it was station six the veronica station a very well-known station uh, it was depicted in art history well very many times mm -hmm. and uh, veronica wipes the face of jesus and um, we invited guler Atesh. she is an artist originally from the eastern of turkey and uh, she lives and works in london now for, for a long time already and i was really impressed the way she works with a theme and uh, always works with a community around that theme. We invited her and then a process begins uh, with the commission and the curator talks with the artist, meets with the artist and composes together and of course in the end it's the work of the artist, it's Güller's work of art but the way but I could sort of mirror her and um, she made an installation in one of the rooms of the Syrian Orthodox Church of Amsterdam that is a Catholic church at the same time so they share the building and um, I challenged her I invited her uh, to put together an installation about refugees and how our society deals with refugees and also with references to the church to the sacred space there to the Syrian community, to the Catholic community, using her signature figure that I really wanted in some <laughs> ways. Um, and her signature figure is um, a veiled woman. You never see the face and, it, and the veiled woman, she moves uh, in different spaces in her work and she photographs that. Because I was really intrigued by the veil itself, the veil is always something very mysterious and it covers a lot and, and at the same time it shows a lot because it is a veil mm -hmm. and um, uh, it is used in many different um, cultures think about the sari or the burqa from India from, from India the Middle East or, uh, from the Middle East yeah. or think about our um, bridal veil that we use yeah, at uh, the wedding yeah, or the yeah. wedding so it it has something covering yourself and then opening and it has it's it's a package and at the same time it's a it, it is a telltale detail so she photographs people or this this lady woman veiled in different spaces in different her spaces signature yes look. that's uh, her signature figure is the veiled lady and um, so i i challenged her to put so many different aspects in an installation that we 
commissioned. Mm -hmm. And what she did was really brilliant. She went around and she interviewed many, many Syrian refugees and refugees from uh, from all other countries, so many other countries, who live in the Netherlands or in London, where she lives. And we together visited refugees as well. I remember one, a, a beautiful young uh, boy and just an incredible story, very strong person. It was for me such a such a treasure to, to have the discussions and it really enriched me too. Mm. And um, Guler gifted or gave time and attention to all these people. She really listened to their stories and asked them to write their story of the journey, of the in-between. And um, there are beautiful stories in all kinds of languages and we also made a, a book just an English translation and we put it there in the installation so that people can read more of the stories. And those stories she transformed into a wallpaper filling the whole kind of room, floor inclusive. Mm. So if uh, these are fragment, fragmented stories in all kinds of languages printed in, a, in an ancient letter style in a font that refers to, to you know, to codices, so the beautiful old calligraphy kind of uh, calligraphy kind yeah, of writing. Yeah. So um, subconsciously, it referred the way it was presented. It referred to our big, great stories, whereas they were stories of simple people, refugees fleeing mm. and uh, in between struggling. Mm. Sometimes very poetic. Poetic. There, there are beautiful, beautiful um, quotes I could give you. And um, but this was one that really worked with people. They enter the room. With words, 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 words. You know, they. You are puzzled. You are discomforted. You are disorientated. Mm. You, 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 you have to sit down mm. because it moves. It was printed in a way as if it was waving. Okay. So, your idea is that there is this there's this cacophony of uh, of 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 sounds, whereas there's no sound. Mm -hmm. um, words and stories, and it. It appeals to me, and I have to deal with it. But it's too much. Mm, overwhelming. Uh, in it's a way. overwhelming. Mm. You have to sit down. And then we chose four photos from the ten thousand she made of this veiled figure in the church, in the sacred space. And these photos were put on the walls, just four of them, in the midst of this overwhelming wave of stories and 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 horror mm. and. Uh, life and death struggle there were these windows showing this this serene beautiful silhouette so you it has a beginning the project and then it ends what is that like for you to end a project and move on to the next project it seems so all-consuming well it's called turkey you know <laughs> mm. and um, for me the most exciting is to build the project itself, because so that's my creative process. Mm -hmm. And then on the day of the opening, I I've, I've truly enjoy the opening as the feast, but it, my work was already done. Then it's done. And then in the process, I, I uh, led people around and I, I had... Um, you gave a tour of the... I gave tours for, for professors of religious studies and all, all kinds of groups, and I, I really loved their feedback. And it's like giving a present every time I enter a room and I know already, you know, what's going to happen. And, and, and I, but I am surprised, seriously, I'm surprised every time. Mm. People are so different, what we talked about. Yeah. He, um, the worlds. The, the people are words on their own mm. and, they re and I learned so much of their reaction. Mm. So it was a great thing. And then when it's done, I, I had to have a break for some time, <laughs> yeah. just being exhausted. Um, you do write a blog, so if people want to find out more about you, I'll put that in the show notes or the podcast notes as well, that people can also look back in the archives. Yes, because, uh, thank there's you. There's information yes. and people can read about it. I think I know the answer to this, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. Is art important and why? Oh, yes. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I think you think art is important. <laughs> but sure, love to I know do. why sure, art is important. Sure, I do. Art, art is a, a way of expressing uh, things that are unexpressible about life, existential things. And art has, of course, very many forms. We talk about visual art at the moment, but I'm trained as a, a literature major and, um, and I'm an expert in stories. And art is, visual art is one way of 
of telling the human story. And um, I think everybody is searching for, for a meaning in life, some sort of significance or purpose. An idea, if you have an idea about it or, or, or you, you collect knowledge, it's somehow not satisfying. I think to be able to have a significance or purpose, you need some kind of experience or experiences that show you that some things are priceless. Some things are not commodities. Mm. There, is, uh, there are some things in life that you experience as so deep and so wise and so sustaining and a sort of sustaining loving force uh, behind or in or around all things. And if you can experience a glimpse of that sustaining force, then you feel yourself significant. Just the way that you get it makes you feel significant. <laughs> and at the same time, it opens your eyes to, to the larger picture. To, to, and, and, and it can be this extremely positive experience of, of being sustained by this uh, loving force, uh, the loving source, the source of life, the source of love. That idea that some things in this world will never lose their significance, no matter what circumstances are. And those are good and sustaining forces. That uh, is something that I'm really looking for in art. That gives the civilian courage, so to say. <laughs> it, it gives you courage to live. It gives you courage to face sometimes incredible pains and disease and um, death and um, well we had a uh, our share of, of, of horrible things as well and so I speak from experience mm -hmm. that um, if you every now and then can plug in to that sustaining sustaining force then uh, you um, then you you can face life and uh, more than that you can live uh, a life that you experience as meaningful and I think it's a, even more important than feeling happy you know more Dutch people are happy mm -hmm. but just a very small percentage of those happy people think that they ha they have a meaningful life mm -hmm. and those who think that they have a meaningful life are a lot more balanced and are able to give a lot more and have a lot more satisfaction in their life so this is why I think art is so important because art is a way of expressing those pearls of existential wisdom an artist can find mm. if the artist is looking for them. Mm. We've spoken about art before, we know each other, mm -hmm. and you've shared the story that you have a painting in your house, that if you look at it in the morning, it helps you make a decision for your day. Mm -hmm. That's how concrete it is. That's how concrete it is. And now I have a, a sculpture in my home. <laughs> <laughs> so everything I put on my wall has an, has an inspirational value to me and to us. And now I have, uh, have this sculpture as well that I, I look upon every now and then and I am surprised. I see different things every time because I change, of course, and uh, the situation changes. But it inspires me always to be happy and grateful with what I have and what I am able to do even though it's 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 balancing you know it's it's the economy of the household how we balance things what we do together and how we develop ourselves but yeah so we should all surround it's healthy to surround ourselves with good art well yes and in uh, I wouldn't put maybe I would put a, a very disturbing piece of art in a museum or in one of my shows because I want to make a statement because I want to be an activist in in some part of our complex world but um, in my home I would certainly put uh, pieces of art that will inspire and encourage me to live my life to give me positive energy in fact mm. and uh, I would put art in my home that has a, a, a positive presence and inspiring presence mm how I understand make me that would make me be a better person mm. make me be more alive more mm. aware sharper mm. and now we come to the artist 
the artists listening to this podcast that work many hours alone mm -hmm. uh, on their art and also maybe wondering, you know, why am I making it or what is the, the reason for me making my art or paying the price that you have to pay sometimes to make your art? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a word for the artists uh, making and creating art? Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to encourage you all that if, if you reach a certain level of craftsmanship, that's number one, that's point one, after, afterwards, try to feed yourself. Try to feed yourself with... Um, poetry or philosophy or religious readings, whatever your background is. Um, feed yourself with, other, with art from other artists, uh, things that, you ins that inspire you, that help you to search uh, answers for uh, ex existential questions. And if you find some of those pearls, Make sure that uh, you can share them and uh, serve the others through your expression of those, exp uh, those existential pearls. So I would like to challenge artists to search for the existential answers to their own existential questions. And search and you will find answers and step from there and uh, express the experiences you experience, then your art will have an added value. And I'm sure about that. Mm -hmm. So if you look around the great artists from the past centuries, that's the added value they have. And it doesn't matter which century you live, you can still look at it and relate to it to a shared common human existential level mm. and if a, if a contemporary artist strives to make uh, art that will last time that will last um, live for the coming generations that will be ap appreciated by coming generations then I would encourage the artist to develop because it is a spiritual gift in the end. Of course, it's craftsmanship, but mm -hmm. it is a spiritual gift as well. So develop spiritual research and try to find and try to express what you find. And that's what people will appreciate. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly are a pearl. <laughs> and it uh, was so wonderful uh, to speak with you and that you share your uh, insights in such a special way with words, that's also one of your art forms, mm -hmm. beautiful words and also the images. We'll put all the details of your, uh, your blog and the resources on the, the, the podcast notes so people know where to find you because you really write beautiful blogs as well. Thank you so much for your time. For Thank being you on this for your subject. time and attention. Mm. Thank you very much. Pleasure, pleasure. There you have it. I hope that you are inspired and that this unique backstage look of art and exhibiting will motivate you to keep making your art. If you keep going, finding your authentic voice, you will make art that touches people. Please take the time to head over to Annika's website and check out her inspiring blogs. I will put the link in the podcast notes. As I mentioned, this episode comes with a special resource, How to Price Your Art. You can download it on my website www.sonyasmallhair.com forward slash price. This resource is full of tips and guidelines to help you find and set your art price just right. Then I have some great news. On the 25th of February, 7 p.m. Dutch time, I'll be offering a live online training. It's an interactive workshop to help artists craft an artist website that works. Maybe you want to start an artist website, but you have no idea what steps you need to take. Or maybe you have an artist website, but it's not getting your art the attention it deserves. Then this training is for you. Inside the live training, which is complete with a PDF workbook, an artist website review and a live Q&A session, I'll walk you through the ingredients of a winning artist website. I'll have a look at how to build your own authentic brand and style online, 
I'll share a winning website content scheduler that will help you with your posting and your content so it doesn't feel like a full-time job and ways that social media can help you amplify your website so you can get more traction and attention. At the end of the session, I'll be doing three live reviews of effective artist websites. And of course, I'll be answering all your burning website questions in the live Q&A. To find out how you can save your seat, head over to my website. Next week, I'll be back with another episode of the Help I'm Artist podcast. If you're wanting to grow your art audience and enlarge your art presence to promote your art online, you can't ignore the enormous potential social media will give you as an artist. In next week's episode, I'll be sharing 10 things artists can do to effectively use social media to build an art audience, how to get more eyes on your art, and start to stand out and get noticed. That's all for this week. Don't forget to share this podcast and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. This makes the podcast more visible and helps other artists find it. Thanks again for listening and until next time. Bye for now.